The Lady of Longpoint. Our story begins in 1854 in a little port town called Amherstburg, Ontario. This was a time of commercial expansion in Canada, making towns like Amherstburg lively places where hundreds of sailing vessels came and went. Raw materials like lumber, coal, iron ore, and agricultural products like corn and wheat were transported in huge quantities on the Great Lakes to growing cities in the east. Most of these goods were loaded onto schooners, the most popular type of sailing vessel used in Great Lakes shipping. One of the many schooner captains who sailed the frigid lake waters was Henry Hackett, son of the local lighthouse keeper. It was the last week in November when increasingly bad weather on the lakes made sailing a risky business. Soon shipping would stop entirely for the winter. We join the 23-year-old captain of the schooner Conductor as he calls on his girlfriend, Miss Annie Archer. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Archer. Wondering if I could see Annie? I suppose. She's in the kitchen. Come in out of the rain before we have a flood in here. It's not proper, but I'll let you see her there. Wipe your shoes on the mat now. Yes, Mrs. Archer. Now, something smells really good. That's the biscuit she's baking. I suppose she'll let you sample one. Someone you know, Annie. Henry, what a surprise! Annie, mind your biscuits now. I'm going back to mending that quilt. Yes, Mother. It's such a dreadful day. Uh. But I guess a little rain doesn't stop a new sea captain, does it? <laughs> Hardly. Nothing could keep me away. My goodness, those biscuits smell wonderful. I, I don't suppose you could... Uh... You may help yourself. How about this one? It looks perfect. Oh, but there's a price. Uh -oh. You must do something about that window. The rain keeps leaking in. Mm. Mm. Of course, you got a loose board here. It looks like a two-biscuit job to me. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> there. Just takes a man's muscle. You just let me know whenever you got a job like that. That's a man's work. I know. Dad's down at the store like always. I'd hoped we'd see more of him when he left the regiment. When you get a chance, you tell him for me that flour of his makes great biscuits. Well, of course, it's from the same wheat we carry on Mr. McLeod's schooner. Uh, well, that reminds me. Reason I came over? Yes? We're taking out a shipment of grain tomorrow over to Port Dalehousie, leaving in the morning. But we'll be back about the 7th, in time for a sociable at Mr. McLeod's residence. At McLeod's? And you're invited? <laughs> sure am. Uh, I think all his captains are invited, and I can bring a guest, too. I wondered if you'd like to go. <laughs> yes, of course. Oh, that would be very nice. W well, I'll have to talk to Mother, but I'm sure it'll be all right with her. Oh, I can't wait. Uh, they say he's even going to have a string quartet from Windsor. Oh, he's such an educated man. I heard he was going to be an attorney in New York. Uh, that's true. And I'm glad he changed his mind. i got a good future now, thanks to him and his schooners. Good, you say? Huh? The storms out there have taken so many souls. They worry about you. Oh, well, the way I look at her, the man needs to do his best all the time, and that goes doubly on a schooner. After that, whatever happens is in the cards. Know what I mean? I believe there's someone who looks out for us, if we let him do it. So I'll pray for you again, just like always. Whatever you want to do, Annie. Right now, I've I got to get down to the dock. I just wanted to tell you about the sociable. <laughs> Oh, here. Take some biscuits with you. I'll wrap them in a napkin. Thanks. I wish you'd come more often. You're always sailing off somewhere. Yeah, but it's not like Waylon. <laughs> I wouldn't see you for a long time. <laughs> I'm thankful for that. Maybe in two or three years we can see a lot more of each other.
I do hope so. So much. Uh, I've got to go now. I'll come by first thing when we get back. And don't let anybody talk you into stopping at one of those saloons along the way. Promise me? I promise. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. And so began another of Henry Hackett's trips across Lake Erie. Many of the men on these ships were not experienced sailors at all, but people who signed on because they needed the work and held other jobs like lumbering in the winter. All right, bring it on, bring it on. Captain Hackett, Captain Hackett, here's your manifest. Just corn this time, no wheat after all. No matter. We just soon haul corn as anything else. Well, have a good voyage, Captain. Thanks. Uh, Jones, come here a minute. Yes, Captain Hackett. Uh, we should be ready in about an hour. Looks like this will be our last load out before the ice comes in. Got to keep Boston Cloud happy, so we're putting in a big load. Yeah, she's well down, likely to leak with a load like this. And we don't want that, so let's hope for good weather. Captain Hackett raised his mainsail, his foresail, and jibs, and sailed away from the wharf. Once clear of the land, he raised his topsail and headed east. Toward evening, the wind began to rise, so he lowered the mainsail and jibs. About midnight, the weather grew worse. John, this doesn't look good. You're right about that, Macaulay. We've got a gale building up. We may have to take down more sail. I know, we've already lost time. Should be up to Long Point about now, but who can see anything in this snow? No point posting a lookout on the bow. Yeah, the seas are getting high. They could wash them right over. We better get the foresail down. I'll get the cap. We got a bad one here, don't we? Macaulay's hands are about frozen to the wheel. Can't make out anything ahead. Let's get the foresail down, boys. We'll keep the topsail up and run for it. After that, Jones, go forward and make sure those hatches are secure. Got to keep her running before the wind. Yes, sir, Captain. Stand by to come up into the wind. Hardly. Get that foresail down. Oh, oh, that water's cold. Jones, are you there? Yes, over here on the foresheet. Get that sail down! Captain, the ropes are frozen solid! Can't run them through the blocks! Break that ice with a belaying pin! Captain Hackett, down below, we got a bad leak. Water's coming in fast. Cousins, you tend to the bilge pump. That's a good job for a cook right now. We're too busy on deck. Yes, sir. Captain, that noise. Had to be the topsail. Can't worry about that one now. Gotta keep it before the wind. Oh, Captain Hackett, the topsail's gone! Just ribbons left! I know! We heard it go! Hang on up there and check those hatches! We're trying! We're trying! The schooner, now without sails, had to be steered most carefully downwind to avoid swinging sideways to the wind, what the sailors called broaching to, and be at the mercy of the high seas. We're icing up here! Real bad! Captain! We've got to stay out of the trough, top heavy with ice. We'll cap yeah, we'll capsize. Happens every year to somebody. We better make it to the base soon. Jones, you take the wheel. Captain, light, port side. Light? It must be the lighthouse. You see it, Jones? No, too much snow. There, there it was. I think we'll make it. Come to port, Jones. Well, it's gone. The light's gone. And the snow's still thick. Come to port. Come to port! We'll have to risk it! She's hard over, Captain! Captain, sir! The build is full! They can't pump fast enough! <sighs> That's all we need right now. 10,000 bushels of wet corn! Mr. McCloud won't like this one bit. Try to come off the wind! Get the wheel over! She won't respond, Captain! Nicodemus is still there! Yeah, by the grace of God, Captain Hackett, the yawl boats are gone! They've swept off the Davids! Yawls are gone? Oh, we've had it now for sure! We must have passed the lighthouse already. There's calmer water ahead. We still got a chance. 
Chambers! See anything up there? Can't see a thing, sir! We should have seen the lighthouse better than that, Jones! Oh, no! We're running aground! The wind gone! There's no! Captain Hackett, that light back there! I know, I know. Had to be on the cut, not the lighthouse. These waves, they'll beat the conductor to pieces. And the yellow boats are gone. We're covered with tons of ice. We can't stay here. We still got a chance to get ashore. We can make a raft. Sawyers, Andrews, Nicodemus, all you men, get over here, now! Quickly, the men gathered anything that would float and began lashing the pieces together to form a crude raft. Finally, they were ready. Steady there. Hold it. Uh, it's impossible. With these waves, how are we going to get on this thing? Here, here. I'll pull on this end while you... Don't let go. It's loose. Oh, I can't hold it. It's, it's too late. It's gone. Uh, that was our last chance. We've only got one choice now. It's into the rigging, men, before the waves take us away, too. Uh, there'll be daylight soon. Maybe someone will see us. Who's gonna see us, anyway? The other schooners would be at the bottom! Tie yourselves into the rigging. It's all we can do for now! Long Point was a forlorn island of scraggly trees and windswept sand. The only inhabitants were the lighthouse keeper some 10 miles away at the end of the point and the family of a hunter named Jeremiah Becker. He and his wife Abigail and several children lived nearby in the crudest of shanties built largely of scrap wood from previous wrecks that had washed up on the beach. Jeremiah had gone to the mainland to sell pelts and buy supplies, leaving Abigail at home with the children. This morning, like every other in her monotonous life there, she had gone down to the beach to get water for her iron pot. And as she dipped into the water, she heard something unusual coming through the noise of the blowing wind and crashing waves. Recognizing it as a flapping of canvas in the wind, she knew instantly that a vessel must be in trouble somewhere close. Then she spied the conductor aground about 200 yards offshore, the nearly shredded sails flapping angrily in the violent winds. At that moment, her every thought turned to helping the sailors, and she rushed back to her cabin through the drifting snow. Eddie! Oliver! Yes, Mother? Yes, Mother? There's a ship stuck in the sandbar. Must have hit bottom during the night. Get your coats on and go down there. They must be looking all over for shelter. Tell them we have the only cabin that's close and bring them back here. Sure, Mom. Edward and me both? Why, why do I have to go too? You know it's hard for Eddie to get around in the snow on crutches. He might need your help. Oh, oh, all right. Now get down there and show him the way here. No one ought to be out on a day like this. I'll heat up something for him to eat. A few minutes later, as she peered through the frosty window of their cabin, Abigail saw the boys coming back, alone. Well, where are the men? Why didn't they come with you? They're still out there, on the boat. They're all hanging up there on the ropes. You can hardly see them. Oh, my word, those poor men. They're all white from the snow, and there's, there's ice all over everything. And their lifeboat is all broken up on the shore. Oh, maybe some drowned already. They'll freeze to death for sure. We've got to help them. Dad took the boat to Port Rowan. What can we do? I don't know, Eddie. We'll see. Well, maybe we can fix their boat that washed up. I'll take a look. Now you and Eddie go back quick as you can. Make a pile of driftwood close to the wreck, and I'll get some coals out of the fireplace. We'll make some tea, too. Nobody's going to freeze to death near this cabin. Quickly, Abigail gathered up a few items, a pot, some tea, a pan with coals, threw on a shawl and rushed to the scene of the shipwreck. The gloomy dawn had come grudgingly, and the crew was desperately looking for help in any direction. They didn't know how long they would last with the mixture of snow and sleet still whirling around them and the ice getting thicker by the minute. All could see their end coming fast, and everyone prayed earnestly for deliverance. Get the hackers! Thought it was gonna clear some, but it worse! How 
How could it get worse? Cousins! You alright? I'm alive. That's all. How about you, Chambers? I feel like a statue! There's so much ice! Jones, my friend. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, no other scooters out, and no houses on shore. And he said we'd have some tea when I get back. She's a fine lady, your Annie. Good cook, too. <laughs> some of her biscuits are out there in Lake Erie right now. And she's got religion, too. You know, she always prays for us on these trips. She's a delicate lady. Maybe she has the ear of the Almighty. Let's hope so. Cap! Cap! There's a fire on shore! A fire! Look over there! Yes! I see it too! Captain Hackett, can you make out anything? I'm trying to see better through this infernal snow. There's somebody by the water! I think it's a woman! She's waving her arms and you... Quiet! Quiet, everybody! I think she's calling out to us. yelling something. Can you make it out? No, I can't. Maybe the winds will calm down soon and we can hear something. All day, Abigail Becker paced up and down the beach, while Edward and Oliver stood nearby, watching the tea and keeping the fire burning brightly. By mid-afternoon, as the storm continued to rage, Abigail knew something had to be done to get the crew to swim ashore, since the yawl boat from the conductor was in hopeless condition. They would surely die of exposure if they stayed all night in the rigging. All she could do was to wade out closer to the conductor and by gestures communicate with the crewmen. Captain Hackett, look there. That woman, she's coming into the water, waving. Yeah. She's acting like she's swimming. She wants us to swim ashore. Swim? She thinks we're seals or something. We're already half frozen. I can hardly move. I'm too far in this ice water. Could the cousins here can't swim a stroke. What do you think, Captain? That water will get you fast. Oh, maybe, maybe another schooner will come along and... Boys! There's not going to be another schooner. Today, uh, tomorrow, or maybe till March. It's evident that swimming is our last and only chance. I'll try. If I live, follow me. If I drown, stay where you are. I hope to see you there by the fire. And with these words, Captain Henry Hackett descended from the rigging. Pausing briefly, he bowed his head, commending his soul to God the Father. Then he took off his heavy overcoat, white with snow and stiff with ice, removed his cap and boots, waited a few moments for a brief lull between waves, and jumped. Captain Hackett did surprisingly well until he reached the point where the powerful undertow began rushing back to the lake. By then, the strength was totally drained from his severely chilled body. Abigail was watching breathlessly. There he is, boys. He's almost here. Oh, but he's just floating there. I've got to go get him. All your clothes! You'll freeze too! That man will drown unless I pull him out. What if he was your father? I'm the only one who can save him. Thank the good Lord you made it. So cold you can't even talk. Just a few more feet and we'll be on the beach. I'll help you get him out. He, he looks like he's unconscious. Edward, what do you think you're doing in this water and with crutches? We've got to save him, just like you said. <laughs> Eddie, Eddie. Now you're all wet, too. Go back to the fire. Oliver can help when I get him to shore. By the warmth of the fire, Captain Hackett soon regained consciousness. Then First Mate John Jones appeared, struggling in the water not far away. Against Abigail's protests, Captain Hackett went into the water to help his friend, but both men sank below the surface, and Abigail had to pull them out, clinging to each other. 
Each time a swimmer neared shore, she went far out, sometimes up to her chin in water, even though she couldn't swim. Once on shore, she did all she could. To one man she gave her shawl, another the shoes off her feet, and she remained barefoot in the thickening snow. Because one man couldn't swim and remained in the rigging, Abigail maintained her vigil by the fire all night. Back at the drafty Becker cabin, the other men were finishing a meager supper, thankful to be alive. I feel, I feel like I'll never get warm. Oh, same here. I spent some time at a trading post on the Yukon a few years back and thought I was cold then. Uh, but this... Your poor cousins, still out there in the rigging. Yeah, and I knew better than to hire a man who couldn't swim. We're gonna go get him in the morning, Captain. Absolutely. We'll be dried out by then and the storm will have passed. The next morning, the men were able to construct a raft and rescue James Cousins, who was barely alive by then and had to recuperate in the Becker cabin for almost a month under Abigail's care. The other crew members left after a week, going back to the mainland in Becker's boat. Captain Hackett was among the last to leave. Well, Mrs. Becker, it's high time I got out of your way. You don't have room here for a bunch of sailors. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Captain, that's nothing. Now, where'd you say you're headed? Amherstburg? Yeah. My father is keeper of the lighthouse there, and that wreck out on the sandbar was Mr. McLeod's schooner. He lives there, too. I hope you're up to the trip. <laughs> Mrs. Becker, ma'am, I was up to it several days ago. But not all of us were. Especially Jim there. Looks like he'll need a while longer. He'll do just fine here. Mrs. Becker, you're like no woman I've ever seen. The way you came down and got us all to jump in, except for cousins there, and then pulled every last one of us out during the storm. I never dreamed I'd say it, but I'd give anything for a whole crew of women if they were like you. Oh, Captain Hackett, don't talk like that. I'm just a wife and mother, you know. Well... My Annie's back in Amherstburg. I've been courting her a while. She's a God-fearing lady, and she's always praying about things like our voyage down this way. That's good. Now I've got something to really thank her for. <laughs> and she'll tell me to thank God, not her. Guess I should tell the Almighty myself. Think I would if I were you. Other years there's been wrecks along here. And if you hadn't had trouble where you did, well, we'd never have seen you. Likely no one was praying for those other ships. That must be so. There's no doubt God's hand has been in all this, putting us here with you and your kids. Now I'll get to spend Christmas with my family and Annie. Maybe she'll teach me how to pray. Well, your husband Jeremiah's waiting for me at the dock. Thanks for everything. You're so welcome. <laughs> 